I arrived from New York City yesterday morning at 6.25 and tried to stay awake all day and did a good job walking around Moscow, Tachana, and a guide walked us around. And it reminded me, as I was putting this together, that there is a lot of history in Moscow, hundreds of years, thousands, you know. And I started thinking about how does that relate to DevSecOps? How can we relate that to DevSecOps? And what I came up with is a very brief history so that we can lay the groundwork for DevOps and DevSecOps so that you can see where we're going to be going with it for the, the next couple of years. How many people here are developers? Very few. Uh, operations? Security. Okay. The I uh, I use um, before DevOps and after DevOps as my uh, cue here. So what we have before DevOps? It started in Japan. How many people know Deming? I need to know where we are here. So, right. This is like the god of DevOps, right? He started conceptually the idea of DevOps. What Deming did is he got called to Japan after World War II to help build a new process for the census in Japan. And when he was there, he gave a talk. And that talk talked about how to get a process flow how to do a manufacturing flow and get it to work properly. And the, the companies in Japan really picked up on the idea, like Sony and Mitsubishi, they, uh, Toyota specifically, you hear a lot about Toyota when you study Deming. And what he did is he talked about this. All right? The idea that you need to start building the quality of the product at the very beginning so that you don't have to go back and redo what you did before at more expense than you started with. Do you recognize that? So quality starts at the beginning. And that includes security. He wasn't specifically talking about security here, but every time you see quality in these slides, I'd like you to change the word to security in your mind because it would start to make sense. I see people taking pictures, which is great. You can have this slide deck when I'm done. I've got an email address you can send me. I'll send you the deck. But if, if they're powerful, please take them and tweet them out. Is there a hashtag, Tatiana, for the conference? Is there a hashtag? No? Okay. So improving quality reduces expenses. There we go. That sounds familiar. If you're in security, this should sound familiar by now in this time in history. The idea of manual mass inspection by a security team is outdated at this point. If your company, if your team is doing manual processing for security processes, you're already at a loss because the systems are too complex, things are changing too quickly, and there's too much that can be missed by a manual process. So, we've got here supply chain management. There's three things I'd like you to think about when we're talking about supply chain management. First one is and Deming actually was much more succinct than this. Deming said, find one supplier. But in the software industry, if we're looking at open source, and whether you know it or not, you are using open source when you're building your applications. 80% of the modern application is built from open source components. What the source code is doing is actually gluing those components together. So what Deming is saying is, Find the best source of your open source components. Don't just grab them 
in general, figure out who's doing the best job and align yourself with that provider. Not only do you choose the minimum number of suppliers, you take the best parts from those suppliers. So how do you do that? How do you find out what the best parts are? There are tools on the market that will allow you to see if a component is vulnerable, and if it is, what version is available that is, uh, has, is relatively secure. So we've got that, then we've got, you've got to track and monitor those. This is the interesting part that the industry is just catching on to. It doesn't matter that you've got one supplier with the best parts. If you put those parts into production and you don't know where they are, and a vulnerability is announced, you lose. It is a game that we're playing here, but it is a critical game. So, minimum number of suppliers, the best parts from those suppliers, and once you put them into your applications, make sure that you track and monitor. You know where they are in your application. How many people uh, remember Heartbleed. You remember Heartbleed? Right. Do you remember Struts 2? Multiple times. Yeah, you open source guys know what I'm talking about. Most people did not know where Struts 2, or if they even had Struts 2 in their application. Because before there was automated security that was actually tracking and monitor components, if you were doing it at all, you were doing it in an Excel spreadsheet. And so somebody had to go and sit for six weeks to find out through all of the applications in the enterprise whether or not they were using struts or not. And from what we have heard anecdotally, they probably missed a significant number of those because it was a manual process. As a security professional, I highly recommend that you figure out a way so that you can automate the process of tracking and monitoring because the next time this is going to happen, and I'm saying it is going to happen, you'll have a way to get to the components that were affected. So, how many people know this book? Please put this on your list. This is a critical book. It's called The Goal from Eli Goldratt. Eli Goldratt created the theory of constraints, which we're going to run through real quickly here so that you can see what he was talking about. This came out in 1984. I read that book, and it immediately in 1984 changed the way that I do business. So, why? Every complex system, and software is as complex as you can get, has a bottleneck somewhere. It has a problem that is slowing the entire system down. And what Goldratt found out is most people, and I hope this word translates properly, but most people are optimizing every single piece of their supply chain. And that is a complete waste of your resources. That's what Goldratt was talking about. Because the speed of your system is dependent upon the slowest part. And when you hear that, you go, well, yeah, that's, that's right. So if I've got simple chain, I've got five pieces in my chain, and this is running at 100%, 100%, 40%, 100%, 100%, the 40% part is the one that is defining what your final output is. And that was something that Goldratt did for the manufacturing industry. And we've taken that into the DevOps processes. And you'll see that when Gene Kim comes up here. Here's Goldratt's theory right here. And I don't need to read that for you, but it, it probably makes sense as you look at it that you've got to find out where that bottleneck is. And you analyze your system to say, this is what's slowing me down right here. And then what you do is you put your resources and focus them on that part of the system because that's the one that is driving your output. Subordinate 
everything else. That means take the resources from everything else and focus on that bottleneck because that's what the real problem is. Then once that constraint is alleviated, it opens up the bottleneck and now you've got 80, 100, 100, 100, 100. Now you need to go to the part that's got 80% capacity. Right? Running at 80%. So this is the cycle that Goldratt created in his theory of constraints. In his book, The Goal, he talks about a Boy Scout troop. It's a, a, a camping, they go out camping. And he realizes that as the people, as the boys are marching through the mountains, they're getting farther and farther and farther apart. And what happens is he realizes that the fastest guy is always going to be at the front. And the slowest guy is always going to be at the back. That makes sense, right? And so the whole system itself of those people going through that um, the camping trip is it gets wider and wider. He stops the boys in the middle of the march and he reverses the line. And he puts the slowest boy in the front and goes all the way back to the fastest guy. So the slowest boy is in the front determining the entire speed that they're walking. And that's what he's talking about. You want to place your constraint as far up front as you can so that when you alleviate that constraint, the rest of the team can march much faster behind. You find this interesting? Is, are you finding something interesting here? I hope. I'm not to the good stuff yet, but this is getting us warmed up. So, this is AD, after DevOps, right? In today's world, 10 years later, this doesn't sound like much, because when we have 100,000 deploys a day at Amazon, this doesn't sound like much. This was unbelievable when John and Paul started talking about it. People at Velocity gasped. And when you get the deck, there's a link in there so you can actually see the presentation. When these guys stepped on stage and said, we are deploying into production 10 times a day, heads snapped back. This is unbelievable, right? So the presentation is in the deck there so that you can see that. Then what we've got is DevSecOps Days. Has anybody been to DevOps Days before? Have you been to DevOps Days? So is there one here in Moscow? Does anybody do a DevOps day here in Moscow? This is regionally organized events where speakers come and talk about DevOps. I mean, I travel around the world doing this, right? So that was the first time. Patrick Dubois and Chris Bytart put that together in Ghent. They had 70, 70 people show up that first time. And again, it's like... Wow, there are people that recognize what we're trying to do. Then Jez and Dave actually created the Continuous Delivery book. Again, looking back on a historical perspective, you can start to see the flow here. What we've got then is John Willis and Damon Edwards brings the concept of DevOps days to the United States, and it starts to blow up. Then, how many people have read this? Again, this is an absolute critical book. If you get one book from this presentation, this is the book that you want to get. It's The Phoenix Project. And what Gene did is he took Eli Goldratt's book, The Goal, that we just saw, and turned it into a story about an operations team and a development team working in an enterprise. And he uses the theory of constraints to move through the software supply chain. This is, again, this is critical. It's said in a different way by Gene, but it's the same thing. It's the same thing that Goldratt said. You cannot look at the entire system to determine the speed. You have to find out what your constraints are and then optimize for those constraints. Optimizing locally is not going to do you any good. In fact, that's what the manufacturing problem was that Goldratt was trying to solve. He went to the manufacturing plants and he saw stacks and stacks of pallets because they had made too much stuff at different locations 
that were piling into this one bottleneck, and this bottleneck was just surrounded by piles of pallets waiting for work to get done. And we see that in the software industry too, because there's somebody probably in your company, he's the go-to guy. This guy knows everything, right? And everybody goes to him for the answer. If you look closely, that's probably your bottleneck because he or his team are overwhelmed. And that's where you have to emphasize. We have to optimize that location within the structure. I see people nodding their head. Yes, that's good that you recognize that. You're even laughing. It's so recognizable. That's great. In 2014, uh, the first annual DevOps Enterprise Summit, Gene, who wrote uh, this book, started the DevOps Enterprise Summit. This was the first time that all of the major enterprises that were using DevOps came together under one roof and told their story to each other. It's an absolute um, eye-opening experience to see how the major banks are using DevOps, how the healthcare system is using DevOps, how Target, how Nike, how Starbucks is using DevOps. Then in 2016, my partner Dev we uh, Derek Weeks did the first annual State of the Software Supply Chain Report. That's when it launched, and it started looking at the industry as a whole. What patterns are we seeing? So in that supply chain report, I want you to keep these numbers in mind as we're moving forward here. One, 31 billion downloads. At the time we looked at that, we said, oh, Jesus, that, that's incredible. There's 31 billion downloads of open source components annually being called from the Maven Central Repository. Then we started looking at it. There's a problem because one in every 16 of those downloads had a known vulnerability in it. When developers are just grabbing what they need, I need a logging framework, and they're not actually analyzing whether it's vulnerable or not, or it has an announced vulnerability. That's even worse. It has an announced vulnerability. There's a real problem there. And we can go through this. Uh, I'm, keep those numbers in mind because I'm going to walk through it yearly as we go here. Then the first annual All Day DevOps Conference. How many people have heard of All Day DevOps? Good. I'm the co-founder of that. So thanks for being here. <laughs> Um, this is, was an interesting concept because we do it all live online. There's no physical location. Derek and I came up with the idea, and 90 days later, nine zero days later, we had 13,400 people globally signed up. And that's when we realized, okay, this is now a global phenomenon. DevOps is here. It's huge. So we did 15 time zone, 15 hours, 54 sessions. Everybody was delivering live from their desktop wherever they were. So we were able to get some of the best DevOps stories in the world in front of the rest of the world. Then uh, the State of the Software Supply Chain report in 2017 was released. We're looking at this. 52 billion downloads the next year. That's how fast this growth of open source and using open source is going. Um, there's a lot of data in here. You can download these reports. The links are in the slide deck. Just look at that just to kind of get a glimpse of what's going on. Uh, it's, it's really, really impressive when you look at the numbers that way. Uh, second annual Devs, uh, All Day DevOps Conference, we had 30,000 people register. So from 13,400 to the next year, 30,000, we had doubled in audience. Again, DevOps was permeating throughout the culture as far as software supply chain was concerned. What I noticed is because I'm the one that, that uh, helps uh, look at the figures after the event is over. I looked at it before. What the speakers were, we had a call for papers out. And I looked and said, what do people want to talk about? And this was the first year we had actually seen this. And I cannot stress this enough. If you are starting a DevOps initiative or a DevSecOps initiative, you do not start with the tools. You start with the culture. You have to get a buy-in from the company, from the developers all the way up to the C-suite in order to get a DevOps initiative started. 
And if anybody in here, you're sitting next to anybody that has done DevOps, I think they will confirm that. Because if you don't get buy-in, by the time you get halfway down the track, there's, n there's nothing left because you don't have the support you need to make it happen. Then Gene, Jazz, Pat, and, uh, and John did the DevOps handbook. Another thing that was huge, software supply chain report comes out again. Breaches increased 55% in one year. What has happened is the adversaries that are actually hacking into the systems, breaking into the systems, have found something that most people aren't aware of. And I'm going to show you that in a second here. If you take nothing away from the slides with all the research on it, this is the one right here that will make a difference in how you do things. The exploit time has decreased by 93%, meaning where it used to be you had 45 days to fix a vulnerability that you had found, that has been decom decompressed by 93%. Third annual DevOps, all-day DevOps, uh, it just keeps growing. This is the 10th anniversary year of Patrick and Chris in Ghent for uh, DevOps days. And again, if you are a company here in Moscow and somebody has not produced a DevOps days, jump in. Because what we need is these are local organizers producing these events and bringing in regional speakers. Plus, you can usually get an international speaker or two to come to something, especially in Moscow. Everybody wants to come to Moscow. This is great. It's been fun. So, this is how quickly DevOps days spread around the world. The first year they did it, there was one event. Next year there was four, six, and five. And then all the way up to this year, there are 72 of these events around the world. All run locally. I'd love to see one here. I'd love to see one here. It looks like uh, DevSecOps Days is on track to do that too. So, why do we need security as a part of DevOps? What is DevSecOps? And why have we put that sec in the middle of the word here? If you don't know Shannon, you want to put her on your radar. This is somebody that you want to know. I call her the godmother of DevSecOps. She actually wrote uh, the DevSecOps manifesto, right? And she defined why we need it. And it's important to realize this, that it's no longer just the security team's responsibility to do security. Everyone in that software development life cycle, in that supply chain, has to be responsible for the security at their point of contact. This is inarguable. We can't argue about this anymore because the security team can't do it. Not only can't they do it, they can't stand on the outside of the process and let you develop your software and then nail you at the end before it's supposed to go into production. This is what Shannon had in the manifesto. But basically, the main thing that she's trying to get at and which we all picked up on is that security must be a part from the very beginning, must be part of the system that's building the software, not something that's tacked on. How many people are on a security team that actually works daily with the developers? Oh, that's great. That's very good. That's very good. Okay. Uh, I produced the uh, DevSecOps uh, uh, Day, the workshop at RSA conference in San Francisco and Singapore every year. And so as we were producing that, we, we built up the audience. Now we have, uh, it is actually a confirmed part of every one of the RSA conferences. You guys know John? Yeah, John Willis is a good guy. 
Um, he's, he wrote something because the DevOps people were saying, why in the hell are you putting the word SEC into DevOps? You're just confusing everybody. And John's response was, hey, get over it. It's just a name. But what John learned, and you can take this back to your team with you if you really want to sell the idea of DevSecOps. When John would go in to talk to executives and he'd talk about DevOps, their eyes would glaze over. They just bored them silly. With that, but when he said DevSecOps, he put the security in there, they lit up because they understand what security means in a general sense. Not to the level you guys do. But when you say that this process is going to help security, that's when the checkbooks start coming out and you can get your project done. So John and I went to London uh, with Chris and uh, Aubrey was there. And we actually did the first DevSecOps days in London. And then we did uh, one in San Francisco and one in Singapore that first year. Uh, epic failures in DevSecOps. I was sitting at a bar in Singapore, and we had just finished an event, and all the speakers were sitting there telling war stories, saying, oh, I completely destroyed a system by doing something. And we all started laughing and said, why don't we write a book about this? So this book is actually telling you how professionals fail themselves, saying, this is how I completely hosed a system. We're going to actually be signing some of these today. Go up to the Swordfish booth after this is over. I've got, you know, some copies that I can sign and give out to people that are interested in that. So second year of DevSecOps days, we did pretty good. Remember, I, I'm looking at Patrick's and I'm saying, okay, he only had four the first year. And look, I've got eight. So maybe I can have 142 of these things going on in 10 years from now. That would be great. Now, that's laying the groundwork. What I want to do now is start to show you some data that we've got from the research from the software supply chain. Can I just, I want to take a breath here and, and ask, was there anything new in there for you that, that we just went through? You were laughing half the time, so I knew you recognized what we were talking about. Right? I'm hoping that there was something new that, to get you to think about DevOps and DevSecOps and how it can actually make a difference when you're building software. And now I want to show you some statistics on why we've proven that it's the way to go. How many people have heard of Equifax? Everybody raise your hand because they've got your data. Right? This is interesting. Three days in March. Sounds like a John Clancy spy novel. Three days in March. What happened is... Struts, the Struts team at Apache announced through the, uh, the channels that there was a, a problem with Struts 2. And within three days, the adversaries had hacked into the Equifax system using that exact exploit. Equifax did not know of the breach for five more months. So the adversaries were in their system that long before they recognized that they had struts and they needed to do something about it. And what you've got is everybody is pounding on beating up Equifax. It wasn't just Equifax. There were major, major systems around the world that were broken into using that exploit. I, I want to make sure that we can see this. I don't know if it's big enough. 65% of the Fortune 100s download vulnerable versions of struts right now. That's scary, right? So here's the way it works. Here's the stats that you can take back with you. Here's the struts vulnerability announced. Equifax announces the breach. This is the thing that I just go, I, I can't believe this. Because you have more downloads of Struts 2 after the breach is announced than you have before it was announced. 
So, we used to have, in 2006, we had 45 days to fix a breach before the adversaries had figured out a way to get into your system. Now, that time has been condensed down to three days. Actually, it's only a matter of hours, but this is more believable, right? If somebody knows what the exploit is and they know that you're using that component, this is what happens very, very quickly. 59,000 data breaches have been reported to the GDPR regulators since May 2018. 59,000 data breaches. Most people don't know this when I put this up here or when we talk to companies about how much open source are you using. Most of them think very little. We have so many developers, we're writing all the code. No. That's not the way it works anymore. Whether you're using the NPM repository for JavaScript, whether you're using the Maven Central repository for Java, uh, whether you're using the NuGet repository for .NET components, it doesn't matter. Everyone is using open source. Every major financial system in the world is using open source. And that's where we need to be much more vigilant in the life cycle so that when things are deployed, when things are in production, we need to know, number one, is what components are we using? And number two, where are they located? And once you have that, you have to be a way to be automatically notified if that component is announced as known vulnerable. If you don't have, if you have tracking and monitoring, but you don't have notification, you don't have anything. This is the trajectory of the download of open source Java components from the central repository. When you look at this, um, it's, it's unbelievable. At 2014, you're looking at 17 billion. Here we are, uh, five, six years later, and we're at 146 billion. And at that pace, we're looking at over a quarter of a trillion downloads just from the central repository next year. If you don't think you're using open source in your systems, you're mistaken. And as a security professional, it's odd to me, personally, that security professionals don't realize that they're putting 90% of their budget around defense parameter, and maybe 10%, maybe, if we're lucky, 10% towards the application layer, when the application layer is the biggest thing that we're dealing with here. With open source, protecting the open source components is that bottleneck that we talked about with Goldrat and with Gene Kim. Problem is, not all parts are created equal. Again, find a source, find a supplier that you trust that's writing good components and use that supplier and choose their best components. What we've found through the software supply chain report is people are not building quality in at the beginning and they're paying for it exponentially at the end. I want you to do a quick calculation in your head. If there is a vulnerability that is found at the very beginning of your life cycle, your development life cycle, and you can fix it there, how much money have you saved if you waited until that vulnerability got into production, this is happening daily, and then you get caught and you have to go back and fix it. There's not even a comparison in money. If you fix it at the beginning, it's, it's I can't even say how much more efficient it is to fix it at the beginning. Not building quality in, 10.3% of those 130 a uh, billion downloads had known vulnerabilities in them. 10% of the components downloaded from the central repository had known vulnerabilities. That means 
that those vulnerabilities were put into production. They're actually being used. And the problem is this. There's 75 security people in this room. I would guess that the 75 security people are probably, uh, you know, if they're outnumbered 100 to 1, I mean, what are you doing? You've got 7,500 people that you're trying to service, 7,500 items that you're trying to deal with as a security person. You cannot do this alone. And that's what I want you to take away from this presentation is that, and you shouldn't have to do it alone. What we need, what we need is the ability for everybody within that software supply chain development life cycle to be a part of working with you. Not that you're mandating anything. What we found is that if as security people we go in and we actually give guidelines and say stay within this area here and you'll be okay. Or, you know, let's work on the most critical things. There's that bottleneck again. Work on the most critical things, the most important things with the team. Don't try to do everything. I know when I first started doing this, and you, you old timers have seen it too, you'd run a report and you get a 600 page document and you slam it on the developer's desk and say, here's the problems you gotta deal with, All right? That, that happens. That and hopefully not anymore. So here's the problem. What that says is that if you're used to doing something a specific way, you will continue to do it that way. Despite knowing that it's the, not the right way to do it. It's because this is what the system has been set up to support you to do, and you really have to go against the system to make this whole process work. There you go, 2014 to 2019. So breaches increased 71%. Why is that? It's a combination of things. But if you look back at what we did here as far as analyzing what the attack interface is and the time to exploit versus the time to remediate, you can see where that comes from. There it is. There's that speed again. I, I keep repeating myself on this because it's so important. You don't have, as a security professional, you don't have the time anymore to manually go through a process for 45 days when the people that are exploiting your system are within the system within three days. It's just a losing game. There's no way you can win. You've got to find a way to build automation and security gates into the software itself, into the process itself, if you want to be able to remediate at the speed of exploit. Where does this all take us here? Where does this all take us? I usually get a laugh on that one. Come on. Does it not translate? <laughs> Uh, you cannot inspect quality into a product. Product has to be built safe. You don't inspect it safe. One of the things that the industry has started to realize through research, Nicole Forsgren, Jez Humble, Gene Kim, Derek Weeks, the people that are analyzing on how all this stuff works. What they've actually found is that people that deploy more often are more secure. When you think that through, it makes a ton of sense. If you are only deploying once a week, and the typical exploit is done within three days, you've already lost four days. And most people, when you look at it, 
you can see they're, they're not deploying at the speed with which is going to be the safest way to do it. So when you look at this, uh, how many people know what a software bill of materials is? And yeah, this is one that we're just starting to work on in depth in the United States here too. Is that a software bill of materials means that you provide a list of all of the components that are within your application and that application carries that around with it. It's when you go to a grocery store, there's a list of ingredients on every item so you know what's in those. Why aren't we doing that with software? A software bill of materials tells me we can do it with containers. I'm sure everybody here is using containers. What's in that container and how do you find out? Why do we have to go and actually pull that container to find out what's in it? Why doesn't it carry a software bill of materials around with it? Why don't your applications do that? And now you've got something that's tangible when something gets announced. So mature DevOps practices, right? 50% of those are using software bill of materials like that. The other thing we want to take with us, again, I'm reiterating what Goldrat, what Deming, or what Gene Kim said, is please look at the entire system, not just the local pieces. You want to look at the flow of the entire system and never pass a defect downstream. This is getting massaged a little bit. I know DJ Schleen brought it up two years ago at RSA. He said, one of the things that we can do as security experts is we cannot slow down the system as security experts because it's the business to put out software. Right? Banks aren't in the business of money right now. Banks are in the process of being technology companies that happen to be in the finance industry. Right? So when we're looking at this, what DJ said is, we can take a defect and allow it to move through the system, but it has to be tagged to say, this is an exploit here that's going to have to be taken care of before it goes into production. So the component can move along, the vulnerable component, but the people that are working the system understand that that's never going to make it into production. But it gives people time to fix it while the entire system keeps moving. So here's the takeaways I want to do with you here. Number one is everyone is responsible. I know you security people in here, but let's start thinking about being part of the entire team and having the team working with you on security. The next one is local optimization does not increase the speed of the system. Just because you get everything except this single piece working fast, this is the slow parts what's defining the output of the system. And the big one here in this room is it is literally impossible today in the security industry to manually do security. You cannot do it. There's too much stuff going on. If there's 139 billion downloads going on, there has to be some kind of management as part of that system. So first, Thank you. I hope there was something here that you could take away with you. Uh, the team at Swordfish, thank you for meeting me in London and then inviting me to talk. That was great. Very much appreciate that. Um, if you'd like this presentation, and you can do it now just on your phones, if you want to send a note to info at devsecopsdays.com, uh, I'll send you this presentation. I'll get you the links to all the resources here. And I'll also get you, I see people taking a picture. Let me get out of the way so you can get that. Um, I'll get to that. I'll get you the links to the software supply chain report. And the new software supply chain report is coming out within the next two weeks, the brand new one for 2019. And I will put you on the list to get that. So please, this is the email address that you can reach me. And then, that's me. Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it. <laughs>